Greetings and welcome back to yet another episode of Lua Tutorials and in this one we'll take a deeper look into arrays and see how we can store multiple instances of data in just one variable and how to access that data and kind of manipulate it in ways that we see fit. So what are arrays? Arrays are a way for us to kind of create multiple instances like I said of data in one variable and we can make an array like this. So we give it a variable name and then we give it give it this curly brackets. And this is just the same way as if we would assign a number value to a variable. For, for Lua, this is of course now a variable called num and it has a value of five and it knows that this is a number value because we are assigning it a number value. It's the same like with, thi with this notation. We're, we are creating a new variable called r, which is not pirate talk, but is actually shorthand for array. And we are assigning it a value of curly brackets and curly brackets stand for that we're creating a new array. So now that we have created an array, we can actually start filling it with useful values and things. So we can create something like this. You might be wondering, okay, so well, I'm a bit lost, but what ha what is happening? You can imagine an array like cells which hold values and you can have multiple cells. Like in this case, we start with one because you, you start counting with one. In some languages, it actually starts with zero, but in Lua, the first index of an array is one. And we assign the first index of an array a value of three. And we assign a second index of an array a value of seven. And of course, the third index of an array is a value of 11. And you might be wondering, well, wh how is that different than actually just having regular regular variables? And it isn't. Array of one is just like a regular, regular variable uh, as we had before, like any number variable or anything like that. And we can do the same things with it. We can output it just like any other number variable. And of course, if I put up array of one and array of three, you can see that if you output array of one, we get three, which is exactly what we put inside. And if we output array of three, we get 11, which is also the value we put inside array of three. So, okay, so, but, but why is that useful? Why exactly do we need to have uh, this way of kind of creating variables, new variables or new values? Well, first of all, one, the main benefit of this is that now you can actually iterate through this, through this array and kind of deal with all these numbers at the same time. So I created a new for loop like we did in the previous episode or learned to create one. We just create a new var variable of i, give it a counter value of one. So because that is our first index in an array and we have three values in an array. And what we'll do for now is just kind of print them out to see what ends up happening. So we just print them out and you can see the, the, the greatest benefit of this is that now we have a way to kind of deal with all these values in, at the same time. And we just outputted the array of one, array of two and array of three, because of course this for loop goes from one to three. And our result is three, seven and 11, which are exactly the variables in sight. But you might be asking yourself, okay, how is that better than just having normal variables and just giving them the same values? Let's say that we have HP of one, three, HP two, seven and HP three, 11. Well, for, for first, there's no kind, there's no way to iterate through this in a very, in a reasonable fashion. Sure, you know, maybe if you have only three variables, if you want to output all of them, you could write something like this, you know, and, and th that's, you know, maybe okay if you have a low amount of variables, but imagine that we have like 100 enemies in a room and we all store it in an array. Having 100 variables and having to print them out is very, very difficult and tedious. But of course, if you have them in an array, Another bonus is that we can just keep adding new enemies or new values inside of this array. And it's really the easiest thing in the world. And the only thing we have to change to kind of output more of them is just change to how to how much our loop goes. In this case, it should go from one to five because now we have five values in our, in our array and we get our, all the numbers that we actually put in. So you can start seeing how this can be useful to kind of hold multiple values of certain of certain enemies or of certain anything actually you want to kind of hold and then access them at the same time without having to rely on having to completely separate variables. So I know this might be a bit confusing and I have a few things to explain which hopefully will kind of shed some more light on this thing. So a, a maybe shorter way, a more compact way to create a race instead of putting every value in a new line is creating it in one single line and you can do it like this which just means that this is a new array and its first index is five. It has a value of five. Its second index has a value of 10 and its third index has a value of 15. 
So that's a much neater way to kind of create it. And you can still, maybe if you want to add something on top of that, you can still create a, a new cell with an index of four or whatever index is coming next after you create your array in one line and just give it any value you want. And this begs the question, because you can keep adding these values up to an array. How long does it go on for? You know, is there maybe a limit as to how many things you can have in an array? Well, technically the limit is some arbitrary number that you don't have to worry about. It's about in the 50 millions or 100 millions. Basically, you can put a lot of numbers inside of an array before it kind of starts going out of space. And then you might be wondering, but how do we know how long is our array if, if that is the case? You know, in, in this case, sure, we can just count the numbers, but let's say that if we had like a thousand and a hundred values inside, how can we actually know that there are a thousand and a hundred values inside? We're not going to count them. Obviously not. So before kind of resolving that question on how to get the length of an array, I have to explain something. So at this point, we have an array called R, which has values of 5, which also has a value of 10, value of 15 on its third index, and value of 3 on its fourth index. And actually, if you kind of went and looked into it, every index beside beyond that has a value of nil. And Lua knows that our index or our array is only as long up until the first nil value. So in this case, it would consider it for long. But if we put a nil value here, for whatever reason, Lua would consider it only one long. Uh, it's not really technically how it works, but just for the sake of it, I want to explain that you can't use nil values inside of an array. That is kind of a constriction of Lua in a case. There are ways to resolve it, but just for the time being, I just want you to know that if you want to use nil values as a way of maybe showing there's no data on that particular uh, cell of an array, you can't actually use nil values. You would have to use something else. Maybe you, you could create your own string value and call it null, and that would be fine. And of course, if you kind of print that, print that out, then you would, you, you would still have the original length of an array, but what you would also have is a way to kind of code that you have no value. So the important, the important thing to here to realize is that Lua considers an array up until the first nil value, so you can have your own nil values in there. How does it get? But okay, so this resolves kind of the first part of the question. But second part of the question is, how do we exactly get our length of an array? Well, there's a nifty function called table get n, and it is spelled like table dot get n, and then we put our array name inside. And if we just do that right now and print this value out, we get a value of three, which is exactly how long our array is. And this can be useful in many cases, this little function, because it does allow you to get, get the length of your array, which also means you can use it in a for loop to kind of iterate your array without having to worry about it. So we would write something like this. And now automatically, however long our array is gonna be, let's just print it out. However long our array would be, let's just, also comment this out so it doesn't distract us. So however long our array is gonna be, it's gonna output every single number that's inside. So at this point, you know, before when we had, had to create a new array, had to loop through it, you might be wondering, you know, that's not that useful. But at this point, it starts getting really useful because you can really start adding any number inside and you don't even have to worry about what, uh, how long it is or whatever. Just having this basic kind of formula for looping through an array allows you to have as many numbers in an array or values in general and this loop will go through all of them sequentially of course and output them or do whatever you want to do and of course when we get to the examples you can see how this can be applied to kind of get some really cool stuff going but at this point you know just having this basic formula allows you to kind of visit multiple instances of different data that is stored in the same variable in a sense okay so now that we got that covered i want to explain another way to kind of go through it to, to, to these arrays in a maybe slightly more complicated fashion. So in the previous episode, I mentioned for loops, but I didn't mention all for loops. There's actually another type of a for loop in Lua that exists that allows you to kind of iterate to values and key pairs in an array. And that might sound a bit confusing, but it's syntax goes like this. Let's create a new array first before I start going and scaring everyone with for loops. And let's just give it a value of three, two, one, and five, and maybe a minus five, and maybe a, another banana on top of that. So what ends up happening in this situation is we would create a for loop normally like this. 
and we would say table get n of array and then we would output every single value. But let's say for some reason we want to get both the index and the value at the same time. Uh, and another way of doing this would be by writing this. So I'll just, just kind of bear with me for a second so I spell it out. So the, the general syntax is the same. We start out with a 4 and then we would write our condition up until it goes but in this case what ends up happening we have two temporary variables and one variable is actually i which stands for index in this case and v stands for value uh, another way of kind of that's usually resolved is k and v and key stands for key and in this case what ends up happening this function i pairs actually returns pairs of this array and in k you're going to get your indices of particular values and in v you're going to get actual values that are stored inside and in this case of course what ends up happening is you have both of these values at your disposal to kind of access at any time well in the previous one you would only be able to kind of get two values in this case you would be able to get two keys as well and you might be wondering that this is maybe a bit useless in this scenario because if you have a for loop that goes from 1 to table.getn what you could end up doing is simply this and that would of course work in this scenario exactly the same uh, of course if I didn't mess up something and put array here so in this case it would actually end up working exactly the same because i is all, uh, as our counter is also the same time our key value which is in this case just an index but this for loop actually becomes much more useful when we get to associative arrays and I'll explain what those are just in a sec. So associative arrays are exactly like regular arrays but the only difference is that their index is not a number but is an actual string value. So if it creates a few more just to give an example what ends up happening is we are creating a mapping for fruits to if they're actually fruits or vegetables. So in this case what ends up happening is we create a new array value or array index called banana, so not a number one but just a value of banana and we, we give it a value of fruit. This can also be anything else but for the sake of this for this example let's just say that we're sticking with fruits and vegetables. So we create another array, uh, array index, zucchini, which holds a value of vegetable and this is exactly the same like regular values and we could we can do exactly the same things with them so if you just print this out we can see that we get a value of fruit and of course if you output zucchini we would get a value of vegetable so that's great but there, there are a few downsides that come with it For, first of all it's much more readable in the sense that as a human you can understand what's going on and you don't have to kind of understand what the indexes mean or what certain indexes hold and in some situations that can be very useful but you can't get the, the, the length of an array anymore because remember the length is only up to the first nil value but in this case we don't have any actual indices which are sequential in this case it's all random you know we just say that banana is a fruit or that our key banana holds a value of fruit and our key lime in an array holds a value of fruit as well and we don't have any nil values so to say that Lua would say okay up until this point we have an array and then we don't and you might be wondering but if you can't know the length with this function how can we kind of iterate through all all of the array without uh, without disturbing anything and one way of doing this of doing this is with the for loop that I showed you in the previous example and in the previous example we used the function i pairs to get our key value pairs but in this case because this is an associative array and not a, an indexed array we just use the function pairs and that's just how these functions work in lua and what we want to do in this case is just go through every single fruit or vegetable and explain or output if it's an actual fruit or a vegetable so we would say that our key keys are banana zucchini lime we would say is a its value so that means that what we would expect to happen is we would get a banana is a its value it's a fruit or zucchini is a vegetable so if we just run this you can see that this actually works but one thing that i kind of have to point out here is that they are not in the same order that you enter them unlike indexed values you also lose the ordering whenever you use associative values and the main reason for that is exactly the fact that you're using associative values in this case you don't care about the order of the values that you put them in the only the only thing you do care about is that 
the, in this case, that the key banana holds the value of fruit and the key lime holds the value of fruit as well and the key of zucchini holds the value of the vegetable. And you don't care about their order and they're actually ordered in a way that kind of makes them easiest to get to when, when it's actually searching for the values, but you don't have to worry about that. The thing that is important is if you want to iterate through every single one of them is you would use something like this, with, which is a key value. Remember, key value is what we use or our index and our value is an actual value that is stored inside of that array index or array key or anything like that. And these are different to our actual, to our actual indexed numbered values because they're not sequential. So if I had to sum it up, that, that's how I would do it. There's also a faster way to create associative arrays and that's just by doing this. And what this ends up doing is creating a key value called banana. In this case, you don't have to put it in strings. It will automatically understand that when you have to actually want to print it, that it's a string value. Uh, and when you print it, of course, we get a value of fruit. So this is just the same as before when we had indexed arrays. This is just a faster way of creating arrays and you don't have to put them in your line necessarily, I just think it looks a bit neater. And of course, when you have that, you can also use every other trick that I kind of showed you before. You can use this for loop or this template for a for loop to iterate to every single one of them to kind of put whatever it's holding and its value as well. So in this case, it's exactly the same as before, just the difference is how we kind of created it at the start. And this is maybe a bit neater and that is maybe how you want to do it. I'm just giving you options to kind of know what's going on. Okay, so this is the end of the first part and because whenever the video is too long, I tend to split it into more parts. So just that it's a bit more manageable to watch. And I feel felt like this is a good spot to end it because we did cover some of the basics, like some one dimensional arrays and some associative arrays. And in the next series, of course, we're gonna go over to two dimensional arrays or n dimensional arrays, I guess. And of course, the examples that follow this two part series together. So if you have any questions, please ask them. I'll be sure to answer them whenever I can. And I hope that you enjoyed it and I hope to see you next time.